everyone and welcome to this Fantasy Fellowship YouTube video. My name is Izzy and I'm a writer and Fantasy Fellowship staff member and I'm delighted to be hosting our first ever author panel um, in honour of Women's History Month and also to celebrate International Women's Day. We're going to be discussing women in mythology with three wonderful expert panellists and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to them. Uh, so first up we have Shauna Lawless. Shauna is an author and blogger from County Down in Ireland. Her books and blogs discuss Irish mythology, Irish history, current reading and any topics relating to Irish culture that she thinks are of interest. Her debut novel, The Children of Gods and Fighting Men, was published in 2022 and its sequel, The Words of Kings and Prophets, will be released on the 14th of September in the UK, EU and the 3rd of October for the USA love to introduce Rosie Hewlett. Rosie studied Greek mythology in depth and is passionate about reclaiming the strong female voices lost within these fantastical stories. Rosie wrote her debut novel Medusa in 2020 during lockdown and it was released in 2021. Her second novel Medea will be published in early 2024. And finally I'd like to welcome Kate Hartfield. Kate is a former journalist and mainly writes historical fiction. Her next publication, The Valkyrie, follows the story of two women in Norse mythology, Brunhild the Valkyrie and Gudrun, the Princess of Burgundy. It will be released on the 30th of March in the UK, EU and rest of the world and September in the USA. Um, so it's great to have you all here. Um, Shauna and Rosie, you both took part in our Fantasy Fellowship Con in 2022. So this isn't your first rodeo. Um, welcome back. We'll pop the um, links to those interviews in the description below so people can check those out. Um, but a special welcome to you, Kate, because it's your first time with us. We're really delighted to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Great. Um, I'm really excited about everything we've got on the um, on the agenda to talk about. Um, and, you know, I think talking about women in mythology is going to be super interesting, really insightful. Um, so let's get started. Um, first question, what got you interested in mythology to begin with? Was there a particular story that inspired you? And as it's your first time with us, Kate, we'll come to you first. Excellent. Uh, well, I think for me, it was probably fiction based on mythology. So the same thing that we are all doing today. Um, I went, I grew up in Manitoba in Canada and I would go to the Winnipeg Public Library and come home with armloads full of books. And uh, often those books were things like uh, Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising series, which introduced me to Arthurian mythology and, uh, and a lot of British uh, mythology. And uh, another one of my favorites at that time was uh, The Hounds of the Morrigan by Pat O'Shea, which is about Irish stories and uh, just one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, but then I also would read uh, nonfiction about mythology as well. So I had, uh, you know, the Edith Hamilton uh, books and, uh, you know, uh, all of the sort of classic uh, kids books about uh, Greek and Roman mythology as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Shauna? Well, um, my grandmother um, was really into Irish mythology and she wrote lots of her own stories um, oh. and quite, quite often um, her grandkids would be characters in her stories. So one of the stories I'm a, a character in it and so there'd be lots of fairies and the little people and lots of Irish folklore. So I got in through those stories um, because they were like lovely stories that we shared with the family. Um, and then it was as I got a little bit older and um, that I realised, oh, you know, there's lots of Irish folklore stories, there's lots of Irish mythology. Um, and then I started to read that on my own. Um, but uh, there, and there's there's lots of it, like in Ireland, like there's lots of music, there's like murals on the wall. There's there's lots of Irish folklore and mythology everywhere, really. It's sort of more kind of culturally present than maybe other mythologies. Uh, so I sort of was drinking in all of that as well. <laughs> oh, how lovely. It sounds like you had writing in the blood as well, if your grandmother was writing fairy tales yeah. for you all. Yeah, she, she wrote lovely stories. Will, um, 
You'll have to honour her and include her as a character in one of your books at some point, I feel. <laughs> I know. I well, that's that's already in the works. <laughs> oh, OK, awesome. No, Fantasy Fellowship exclusive there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Rosie, what about you? Um, I was actually quite lucky because my secondary school offered classical literature as a subject um, at GCSE and A-level, which I know not all secondary schools offer. Um, so I got to study it at school, which I just absolutely loved. It was actually my sister who recommended that I chose it as a subject because it was it wasn't it was optional. Um, so props to my sister for saying that. But as soon as I started studying Greek myths, I just completely fell in love with it. I had to just think it was so much fun at school, kind of going from maths and science lessons to then going to the classics classroom and then just talking about myths and reading myths. And it just it didn't feel kind of like studying to me. It just felt just I just loved it so ever since then I just got hooked and then I went on and studied at a university because I loved it so much um, and then I've just been now still immersed in the world of myth through writing really just because I love that world and I love the characters. Great that's that's brilliant I mean we I had a similar experience in the sense that my school did offer classics but I actually didn't take it because it was a closed book exam and I was just really worried about having to actually memorize quotes from like Virgil and Homer and that just really put me off um, but the, I remember my school offered if you took classics you got to go on a trip to Greece and a trip to Rome so a lot of people took it just to get the good school trips <laughs> yeah I was trying to bribe people to, to take this to class <laughs> yeah exactly um and then since then I mean we're going to get onto this in a minute but there's been so much in the genre recently and for me what got me back into it as an adult because I was interested in it as a child and particularly around like ancient Egyptian gods and goddesses I thought they were super interesting and how it all bound out with their um rituals and, and ceremonies around death and the pyramids and you know as a child the idea that someone pulls out the brain through the nose with a hook just <laughs> fascinated me um all that kind of stuff but it was then reading the um the Stephen Fry books that really got me back into it as an adult um I think those did so much to kind of bring it into the mainstream almost in a way um yeah. but tales in, of myth and legend have been expi inspiring us with new stories for centuries I mean Kate some of the books that you mentioned as you said you've been reading since you were much younger as well um but I feel like in the last decade or so, probably since the Song of Achilles came out, um, we've seen a real focus on mythological retellings specifically set actually in the ancient original settings um, and often with a more female centric point of view, because obviously so many of these classic stories focus on male heroes and male gods and, and all the things that they're achieving and they really overlook the women. Um, so why do you think that the genre has seen such a sustained success? Um, Shauna, I'll come to you first this time. Okay, um, well I think society in the last say 50 years has has changed a lot, um, especially like in maybe Europe and America. Um, I speak about more specifically because I, I know those cultures more, but I do think globally as well, um, where you know women are starting to legally have more rights, um, their voices are becoming more important, you know, the right to vote and all of that. And so I think kind of these traditionally male stories then like should be looked through a female lens and it's been very important to do that. Um, I think if you read history books, you know, they're war centric, really. They they follow wars and kings. But I think whenever you look more carefully, the women who are living during those times are just as important. It's just because they're not on the battlefield, maybe, is why, it, you know, they are not maybe discussed and given as much attention. So I just think because society has changed and it's like a fresh chance to look at these tales and also for me for like Irish mythology I think very much um, like when I was born and growing up Ireland was very much um, like a Catholic state you know the, the church was very important and that has become less so in recent years and so I do think in Ireland especially there has been a huge um, shift and people are looking at old mythologies a lot more and I think it's just interests to kind of be like well what what did we believe before 
you know, what what did our ancestors believe in and why and how does that affect Irish culture today? And I'm assuming every country is probably having those moments now Mm -hmm. where we're thinking about, well, you know, where have we come from and what were our beliefs and why is our culture the way it is and it's different to another country? You know, I I think there's there's just so many reasons. Um, And I think the Song of Achilles and then Circe especially um, kind of catapulted the genre into the mainstream. You know, it wasn't sort of kind of like romantic fantasies that you kind of got in mills and booms or something. You know, it was actual like important literature mm-hmm. and um, more so maybe because it was female authors and a female gaze and it's fresh then, it's, it's new. It's not a rehash of something that we've already read and seen before. Yeah, absolutely. Um Kate, just as a precursor before you answer that question, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about um, why you particularly chose Norse mythology to focus on um, and then a bit more about how you're kind of weaving that into the kind of space that there is with the genre right now. Yeah, uh, so with this particular story, the story of Brynhild, uh, it, I happened to be telling my kid uh, the story. He was interested in, you know, he's gone through all of the, you know, Egyptian, Norse, everything. And I happened to be reading him Norse myths when he was uh, younger. And uh, it really struck me that the story, uh, so the, her story is part of a cycle um, that has to do with a, a dragon slayer and a magic ring and uh, came down to us through Wagner's operas and in one stream. And I was most familiar with it as a kid through Bugs Bunny cartoons. Uh, so, uh, you know, that all these stories have been around for a long time and have come down to us in many ways. But for me specifically, um, I was one of those kids who at 13 years old read The Lord of the Rings and then read it 30 more times. And, you know, I learned all the runes and I had, you know, I wrote things in runes and like the whole bit. And so for me <laughs> to go back to see the beginnings of that, to understand that Smaug the dragon comes from Fafnir the dragon and that uh, all of this is a lineage. Um, that was really important for me too. So I think then to go full circle and to tell my own stories and to think about how the women in those uh, very old stories that inspired the writers that I read as a kid, uh, how those stories might be told again now um, just seemed to fit with where I was in my life. Oh, that's awesome. And what do you think it is that makes these stories so attractive for for readers now? Yeah, I agree with with what Shauna was saying. Uh, You know, stories are kind of an alphabet for how we understand the world and and we come up with them and see the world um, through those patterns in a lot of ways. And so I think it makes sense that every generation will um, use those stories and remix them and play with them again, as people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years with these same stories. And that's why they have this power. So, um, you know, definitely it makes sense that as our, we live in a time of, of immense change and uncertainty. And so it makes sense that we would return to these things and, and look at the world again and ask how we got here. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, shout out to uh, the wonderful uh, fiction writers uh, like Madeline Miller, who have uh, really blazed a path for this, but also uh, the translators. And I specifically want to mention uh, Emily Wilson, who's translated uh, The Odyssey. And um, I love Maria Davina Headley's translation of Beowulf as well, uh, which is such a fresh new um, sort of female gaze translation of that story as well. Oh, fantastic. I've never thought of reading different alternative translations but you're totally right that you're going to get different things from different translators obviously they they interpret their stories in in different ways so that's a really interesting perspective um rosie you have focused on two um female characters in medusa and now medea who i think are some of the most misunderstood females in greek mythology um what do you think it is it about those characters that makes them so interesting for us to to look at now and contributes to that sustained success of the genre? I think, well, with Medusa and Medea, I think they are such fascinating characters because they are, I mean, they're both incredibly powerful women, which is always great to see in stories, Um, but they've always been written by men and, you know, the stories have survived through the male voice. So I think what's exciting now and and I'm really passionate about now is is telling their stories, but with the female voice and the female gaze, because I just think it's, it's having that understanding 
of those characters. Um, but I also think they are such fascinating, fascinating characters, but you can also see a lot of parallels with, with women in, in modern society, like with Medusa, though she's got, you know, the snake hair and all the rest of it, there's still so many elements of her story that sadly women still go through today, like the victim blaming, being demonized for a man's crimes, being silenced. It's all these things I think women can find, though it's, it's set in these mythical, fantastical landscapes, I think women can still find a real deep connection with their stories. And, and with Medea as well, as I'm writing now, there's, there's so much of her story that is a lot about me her mental health and, and how she kind of navigates that and, and those around her who take advantage of her. And, you know, Jason, who is the king of gaslighting, which I think a lot of women can like have experienced gaslighting, sadly. So it's, I think they are really relatable stories as well as being fantastical. So it's that I think it strikes that perfect balance. And then now it's just exciting having women who are reclaiming those stories. Um, I just think it's, yeah, it's, it's a fun, exciting time to be in this genre. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Those are all really insightful answers. And um, I've already learned something. I knew I was going to learn a lot tonight from, from this panel, but that was awesome. Um, we're going to get into the nitty gritty a bit more now. Um, what sources were you able to access for your books and how difficult was the research process? If you have any sources that you found particularly useful, um, we'd love to hear about those because I'm sure many of our members and viewers will go off and read them themselves. Um, but Kate, I'm going to come to you first, actually, because from what I've read around Norse mythology, it's one of the um, kind of ancient cultural phenomena that we actually have relatively little source material for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, an interesting thing for me about retelling this story is, um, like many myths, it was historical fiction uh, when it was told in the earliest forms that we have. So the earliest forms that we have are in manuscript are um, around sort of 12th, 13th century in both the, the Norse versions and the Germanic versions that we that tell roughly the same story. Um, and so they were telling a story that had happened 800 years before that in the time of Attila the Hun and the uh, changes to the Roman Empire um, in the fifth century. So, um, so they were already old at the time and we know, you know, you can look on at the carvings on rocks and see that that even hundreds of years before that, the same characters and the same stories were being told. Um, so even the earliest that we can go is not the earliest. Um, but luckily there are wonderful translations. Um, I don't read uh, Old Norse and I don't read uh, Old High German or <laughs> anything like that. So I just, I, I did actually learn a little bit of Norse to try and, and uh, understand a little better, but not enough to read the whole thing. Um, so I actually have, um, the Song of the Nibelungs, which is uh, the Germanic version I actually have in the Tolkien's Bookshelf uh, edition, which is a, a series of books about Tolkien sources. So that was kind of neat to have. Um, and the others, uh, the Song of the Volsungs is the Norse version. Um, also the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda both have uh, elements of these stories in them. And then there are some other medieval manuscripts that I was able to find um, pretty good translations of, uh, of all of them. So um, I'm lucky in that uh, nothing was too obscure for me. Yeah. And then how did you take all those various sources and actually craft them into your own story that you wanted to tell? Yeah, the, uh, I, it was difficult at first because uh, I, I had at first I struggled with wanting to be sort of... Um, internally consistent and make sure that if I chose a Germanic name for one character, I'd have to use the, the Germanic names for all the characters and things like that and, and just be really consistent. And eventually I realized that the stories themselves are sort of um, like a conglomeration of many different cultures and times and they're not, there's no consistent source anyway. So trying to force consistency on them was in a way um, not consistent with, with, with the history of the story and playing around is actually the most respectful thing to do because these, these have been played around with for so many years. Uh, so eventually I just kind of had to read everything and then let it sit and think about the characters as my characters and then just tell my own story and not be too fussed about which elements I drew from which, um, uh, from there. Uh, so the, the research, uh, had to kind of sit, <laughs> sit with me for a little bit first. Great. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's gonna, there's so much that you're going to need time to kind of let it sink in in a way so that you can then digest it and create something that's all your own. Mm -hmm. um, Rosie, you must have somewhat had an almost opposite problem in that, you know, comparatively for the ancient world, we have 
a relatively rich source material for ancient Greece and also obviously literally centuries of reinterpretations and retelling so how did you what sources did you use um you know obviously you have that classical education as a background so you probably started off from a kind of higher higher element than if you if you started from scratch when you started writing but what did you use the most how did you kind of put your own stamp on it um for the medusa um i primarily would say I took inspiration from Ovid's Metamorphosis because he was the one who gave that initial backstory of her being the beautiful maiden who was taken advantage of by Poseidon. So that definitely was what sparked the idea to tell her story and what happened to her. But I mean, Medusa pops up everywhere um, in little bits and pieces throughout history and throughout the myths, but she's surprisingly very absent. She doesn't have a voice. Like we, we rarely hear Medusa speak for herself. She's just kind of that archetypal villain. Um, so I think it was it was really important and interesting for me to, to give Medusa that, that voice. And so she could actually have a chance to tell her story. Um, I also looked at, obviously there's a lot in um, art and architecture in the Greek world. Uh, you've got the vase paintings as well, that they all tell their own stories. They're not written down, but they, they, they tell stories in themselves. So it's really interesting to look at that and to look at the the reception of, of Medusa, how like in the fifth century, she kind of went from being a monster to being more of a beautiful woman, like a seductress. And, and then even further on, just seeing her reception throughout history. Um, because when I was writing Medusa, the way it's written is, is like she's talking to a modern audience. So she's self-aware of, of her reception throughout history. So I wasn't just looking at the ancient sources. I was also just looking at how she's how she's kind of grown as this character and how different eras have, have received her. Um, and then with Medea, obviously there's Euripides' Medea, which is a very well-known, very fantastic play. Um, and then there's um, Apollonius of Rhodes' Jason and the Argonauts. Um, I think with Medea, it's almost more daunting because the play uh, by Euripides is so well known and Medea's dialogue and that is so fantastic and she's such a fantastic character that it's it's taking this formidable amazing character and thinking what can I add to this what can I change how can you bring your own your own twist to it to really kind of make it authentic um and I think Kate's point's really interesting about you've got to think of them as your characters and your story so it's you take all this information but then this is your version of the story and this is you know my version of Medea and how does how will she react how will she do this and yeah, it's it's um it's a, it's a balancing act, I think, of, of staying true to the source material, but also reinventing it as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you're kind of walking with the uh, the weight of the history and of all the interpretations and the history of those characters and how everybody else has has kind of taken them and made them their own on your shoulders. You're like your own mini atlas holding up the yeah. the previous <laughs> previous incarnations. Um, just out of interest, you mentioned about everything, all those previous um, interpretations of Medusa. Were there any that were particularly startling or surprising that you came across that you hadn't expected when you were doing that research? Um, there was there was one vase painting that I came across that I thought was really interesting. I can't remember um, the name of the creator of the vase, but it was um, it was. Medusa was just a kind of a beautiful maiden and she was just asleep and Perseus was sneaking up behind her with a dagger to kill her and I just thought that's an interesting portrayal of, of like the switching of, of Perseus being the villain and her being the victim. Um, I hadn't expected to find that kind of portrayal of her because everything I'd seen it's she was either a monster or that beautiful seductress who you know was kind of beautiful but with the snake hair so I thought it was interesting to see that version and and just starting to think about all the different ways that you, you can view that myth and you you can view her and Perseus as yeah that was what surprised me. So that was an, an ancient vase so that shows that there was actually yeah. uh, you know differences even in the ancient interpretations of the myth too. Yes yeah it was an ancient vase so I think they must have had awesome. so many different ways that they told the story yeah. Yeah and Shauna what about from your perspective because obviously you were working within you know not just mythological history but your own cultural history as well and and you know it's something that you're extremely passionate about in terms of Irish mythology Irish history Irish folk telling um you know what kind of research process did you have um 
what did you find the most useful and did you kind of constantly feel that you had this responsibility in terms of to the Irish culture and, and what you were what were you were creating? Yes, I definitely did. I think sometimes um, Irish culture is sort of um, like it's like St. Pat, like Paddy's Day, kind of everything's green and like we're leprechauns and drinking pints of Guinness. And like that is part of Irish culture, like that that does happen. But that's <laughs> that's like a day, <laughs> like a festival. <laughs> um, Irish culture is much more than that. And, you know, it's more than Darby O'Gill and the little people. It's, it's um, you know, there, there's so many different areas of it. So I did really feel that responsibility, um, but and also because um, Irish mythology and Irish history isn't done very often, and I did feel like I really wanted to get it right, um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't want anyone to come back with me, come back to me and say, you know, you've completely messed this up. This is not how things were back then. So I did lots of research, and I also sent it off to like lecturers. Who taught Irish history and worked in archaeology to uh, to read it, to check, you know, just to be like, is there anything here that I have picked up wrong? Um, so no, I did. I definitely did feel that responsibility um, because, and then also in my book because it's historical fantasy. So it is set in the tenth century Ireland, but there are two women. Um, and other characters who are from the mythological tribes of Ireland. So we have the Fomorians and the Tuatha de Danann. So for me, I had to research, well, read um, like mythology, which I've always done, but I had to like read it with a focus this time instead of just reading it for the story. So I had the mythology, I had the history. So all, uh, and there's not loads of history um, documents at this time, but there are a few. So reading that. And then also researching kind of what did houses, what were they like at this time in the 10th century? Um, what were the laws in Ireland at this time? Um, so cultural research as well. And then trying to weave all those three things together to make the story feel authentic and um, I suppose as accurate as possible but while also having that mythological and fantastical element as well so there's like there's, this was never ending research you can do even though in terms of like the historical sources there was really only three or four major ones to look at mm. and two two of uh, two of them the big ones but even at that um around that there's a lot to read there's a lot to to research yeah, and I suppose particularly with, I mean, with all of these, um, with all of these different areas, a lot of it is, it's not written history, it's oral history as well, isn't it? It's about how people have been passing down these stories as they tell, you know, tell them to their children, you learn them in school, like it's not just about the written text. So I suppose even if you can't find written sources, just talking to people about you know, oh, if you had this myth, if you had this legend, like, what do you think about this? Even to the extent now in, you know, in, in our times, you know, if we watch this film, what did you think of this character? You know, there's so, it is such a, it, it's funny because it's a rich source field in a way, but it's also lacking, lacking definitive source, I suppose. Um, But that just leaves much more room for creativity, which is possibly answering my own question about why we've seen such sustained success because there's so much room to create in the genre um i'm sure that um our members will be scribbling down on some of the books you guys have mentioned to go, to go and read themselves um say so thank you for that uh we can move on to the um actually before we move on i think i will ask one more cheeky question about your research processes did any of you spend lots of time in museums just, you know, looking at actual original pieces from the time period? I know that if I was um, writing a historical fiction piece and I have thought about it, um, but not quite got to the execution yet, I would just use excuses to spend lots of time in the British Museum and the Museum of London just looking at old stuff and thinking about how I could get that item into a um, into a story did did you guys do any of that is there kind of particularly good museums that you've been to that that have a lot about your various um areas that you've researched uh rosie do you want to go first because we've i mean most of us have probably seen some roman and greek vases in our times <laughs> 
Yes, yeah. Well, um, I was actually, when I was writing Medusa, it was during lockdown, so I couldn't sadly go to any museums. <laughs> but, um, but having studied classics at university, I had lots of opportunity then. We had um, like trips to museums regularly and we actually got to go to Greece and do a study tour around Greece to all the amazing sites. So, um, so I've been quite lucky in being able to be exposed to the amazing architecture and history of that. But yeah, I mean, there's so many, there's so much Greek architecture and art that's surviving. I think we're, it's it's amazing, really. And um, and and yeah, I mean, if people can go to Greece, I would highly, highly recommend going to Delphi. It's not linked to either of my books, but Delphi is amazing. Like where it's positioned in the mountains and and the sanctuary is like built up up on the side of the mountain and the view is insane and you can tell why the ancient people there believed it had you know the gods walked among them in that area because it does feel magical so that would if you can go to go to Greece I'd recommend Delphi. Fantastic what about you Kate? Um, a little bit so I wrote um, a lot of this book during the pandemic as well um, so but even I, I had started to think about it and was researching it um, when uh, my family and I took a trip to uh, to England in March 2020, actually, and we had to cut it short and come home. Um, but I remember walking around the British Museum at that time and looking at uh, a lot of the jewelry from fifth century Europe because I already knew that I wanted to I wanted to set my story when the story had always been set, which was fifth fifth century Central Europe. And uh, so I was thinking about, oh, these brooches, you know, these sorts of things would be would be perfect uh, for that. And um, sort of bookending that um, just a month ago, uh, just when I was working on the the last page passes for the Valkyrie, um, I went to the National Gallery of Canada here in Ottawa, and they had a little, exhibit of some of the books um, from William Morris's 19th century press, the Kelmscott Press, which are these beautiful, gorgeous illustrated editions and was really looking <clears throat> looking back at the past for inspiration. And um, one of the books was this beautiful, huge uh, version of Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, who is one of the, the main characters in the story that I'm retelling. And um, so to see, even though it wasn't, a, you know, by no means an original or primary source of any kind, um, to see that lineage of people who've been retelling and retelling the story was kind of neat as well. Yeah, definitely. I can imagine that's quite impactful actually to see a story that you're retelling in such a beautiful um, mm -hmm. physical setting like that. Um, what about you, Shauna? Um, so yes, um, I suppose because I'm from Ireland, there's a lot of um, like dolmens and cranogs and that still exists, you know, that are local. So. Mm -hmm not museums, but you can go and see them. Um, there's like a, a Leganani dolmen is just five minutes away from my house, which is like a king or queen's burial site. And you can just go and see it. Um, but in terms of uh, museums that I had gone to, there's the Wexford, uh, Wexford uh, National Park, which has kind of remade houses from various eras in Irish history. So um, you can kind of walk through the park and it goes up to the Norman conquest. So you can see how um, Irish people would have lived at various stages, which was very useful. Because sometimes you read the texts and it's kind of hard to imagine what the house would have looked like. Or like for ages, like in, in those days, you would have had a fire in the house and the smoke would have gone through the thatch. But for ages, I was like, how, how does that? work <laughs> um but you know the thatches would have been constructed in such a way that the smoke could escape and it's only when you see the houses that you're like oh right yes i can i can see what this looks like so that's very useful um but the ulster museum is really good uh there's lots of biking um exhibitions and there's a biking museum in dublin as well which was really useful uh but really not so much museums i think there's a lot of Irish uh, castles and a lot of kind of abandoned cranogs and uh, dolmens that you can just see you know you, yeah. you, it's um, I prefer that sort of history but Ireland's in that lucky position where I suppose it's such a like most of it is rural that lots of these things still exist and haven't been bulldozed down to make yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so so I was very lucky that way yeah, there's something about that, like, 
physical space that you were talking about as well, Rosie, about when you're actually standing in a place and, and feeling yeah. that ancient history all around you. Um, I remember when I was a child, one of the things that impacted the most, and I was very lucky in this sense, is that there was an ancient Roman villa in my town next to our train station. So, you know, it was just literally on, on a little site, like with a kind of, from a, from the outside, it just looks like a brick shed. Well, not shed like a brick a relative like you know one of those like purpose-built houses kind of things that you see on the motorway sometimes on a lorry just looks kind of like this quite small building and it said it was a roman villa and i remember going on school trips there when i was about seven and doing the um crayon rubbings of like mm -hmm. the brass yeah i feel like that's a rite of passage for, yeah. for school children and um, but i think especially when you you grow up with it so close to you you can sometimes take it for granted and then it's not until you go to somewhere like Athens like you or like Delphi like you mentioned Rosie that you realize that oh, this is on my doorstep or or it's under the ground where you're walking you know in in London which is where where I live we have um you know an entire Roman city buried under on 20 feet under the streets so so yeah it's always around us and kind of permeating our everyday existence both physical and culturally I think um Right, I've asked you lots of serious questions and you've given me brilliant answers. So thank you so much. I'm gonna move on to the um the more quizzical part of the um, of the uh the panel. So first things first, difficult questions here, but fun hopefully. Can you each please tell me your favorite myth and your favorite goddess? Um Rosie, you can go first. Um my favorite myth has to be Medea. I am biased because I'm writing at the moment, but she's just awesome. I love how she just does so much. She's so powerful and, and everything, like if, when you read her myth from beginning to end and everything she goes through, she's so badass. <laughs> and I just think she's, I mean, questionable, like questionable morals, but I, I love her. So um, I think Madea is amazing. Um, and favorite goddess. Um, I love Hecate just because I think being the goddess of witches and the moon and spirits and all that kind of stuff is really cool. I also love Nyx just because there's um, it's written that Zeus was scared of Nyx. She's the goddess of darkness. And I just like the idea of Zeus being scared of a goddess. I think that's I just I love her for that. So <laughs> one of those two, I think, would be my favorite. Definitely. I, I love Hecate's um, like her, her look as well, like the three different yeah. kind of sides of her and how that's often actually um represented in statues and stuff with it having three faces i love all of that i think that's a great vibe uh shauna what about you um so my favorite um story for mythology is obviously from irish mythology and it's called the second battle of mutura uh, and it's this great epic battle between the two of Danon and the fomorians uh, and I love it. It's there's like a lot of the build up to it, and um, there's like so many different characters, and it's so magical. Um, I think some some of the other Irish mythology stories, like the Cattle Raid of Cooley, they're just not so magical, even though I love them. Uh, so the the older mythological stories just have all that magic. So there's like weapon makers and warriors and witches and druids and cupbearers and harpists, and there's just so much magic. Um, so that's my favourite. And then my favourite goddess would have been the Morrigan. So very good choice. Um, Kate, what about you? Um, favourite myth, I would say um, from Arthurian mythology, the, the story of the Fisher King. Uh, you know, there are some stories that just get under your skin for some reason. And there's something about them that just feels like there's a mystery there that you you don't quite understand or um that there's just something more you want to explore with that one and so that that's one for me that's that's always it's felt very dark and interesting and like there are things layers to it that i haven't yet understood um and i've never written about it but maybe one of these days uh so that's uh, definitely one of them and um goddess goddess is so hard for me i'm a big fan of the morgan too i love all the triple goddesses i mean triple goddesses are great so um but i think i will go with um i'll go with hell or, or hell who is the the mistress of the underworld in in norse mythology or one of the underworlds um and uh she is just she kind of does her own thing and she doesn't and she doesn't let anybody else in <laughs> she doesn't want to see at the moment and um you know she is uh, I think as scary as uh, a Lord of the Underworld should be. Um, so yeah, I think I'll go with her. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, next tough question. What is your favourite, if you're going to pick one, your favourite mythological book, and I'm going to say excluding each other's, because <laughs> that would be the diplomatic thing to do, but um, excluding each other's. Um, Shauna, I'll come to you first. Oh, um, there, there are so many. I think um, for me, when I read uh, Circe by Madeline Miller, that was a bit of a, oh, you know, that's that's really good. Um, I And I really like the song of Achilles, but I preferred um, Circe. Mm -hmm. For me, it was just really, really uh, just a fantastic story. Um, but I also, even before that, like I would have read, um, have you ever read Philippa Gregory's The White Queen? Yes. He's the kingmaker's yes. daughter. And I really like the way, like mythology isn't a huge part of it, but the, the White Queen, which is Elizabeth, and her family are descended from a French water goddess that gives yes. them mm -hmm. magical powers. And I like that as well. I thought that was really well done. Yeah, they're calling on like, calling on the weather to assist them in times of need, aren't they? I, re I remember that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I wouldn't have thought about that. Um, Rosie, what about you? Um, I have to say Song of Achilles just I feel like it's the obvious one but I just I when I read it it just blew my mind I think because I was around 15 when it came out and I was studying classics at school and I think I was studying classics and reading about all the myths and then this book came out and I read it and it suddenly just like opened this door of, of like oh I could I could write my own version of the myth it was just knowing that you can still retell them now and you can bring your own touch and how Madeline Miller kind of crafted that story so beautifully. It just, it really, I just, I, I love that book. I can't, I can't, it's my favorite always. <laughs> Fair enough. We have a lot of very big fans of both Song of Achilles and Cersei mm -hmm. in our community. So I'm sure there'll be lots of people weeping that choice. <laughs> what about you, Kate? <laughs> Yes, I love I love Cersei too, and I love Song of Achilles too. But uh, Cersei forever. Um, well, I will choose. I mentioned at the beginning uh, the book The Hounds of the Morgan by Pat O'Shea, and that remains, I think, my favorite mythological book. Um, it is uh, so. I'll just use this opportunity to say a little bit more about it. It was written it. in the early yeah. It's uh, back from the early 1980s. Um, and uh, Pat O'Shea spent 10 years writing that book. And so as a budding writer, knowing that because it was on the back copy of one of my favorite novels always gave me a lot of hope <laughs> that, you know, um, sometimes things take a while and writing careers take a while to develop. And um, so that was was just neat for me to see. And uh, it's a wonderfully written, really thick book about two children who um, in Ireland who uh, sort of end up uh, living in the world of of gods and goddesses and and old stories and um, and there are things in it that are quite creepy as well, including the hounds, the hounds that chase them and that take the take uh, the form of these sort of silent men in trench coats and stuff and and that it just the the sort of duality of the old world and the new world um, and things not being what they seemed really uh, spoke to me as a kid and and it's just remained one of my favorites. Oh, that sounds really, really fascinating and also quite mm -hmm. sinister. Um, mm -hmm. But we like, like things like that in Fantasy mm -hmm. Fellowship. So like I said, I'm sure plenty of people will be adding that to their TB red lists. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, it's time for our last question. I can't believe that we're, we're at the end of the questions already. Um, we have, have been talking for quite a long time. It's, time flies when you're having fun. Um, are there any books that you would recommend that explore myths outside the Greek pantheon? Now, I've said the Greek pantheon because I feel like the Greek pantheon is the one we see on most of the bookshelves. And that's because it's fantastic and it's, it expands so much, huge depth, huge breadth in terms of what you can explore in the Greek pantheon. Um, but I feel at the moment we're actually seeing more and more books come out from other um, mythological pantheons. And I know we've mentioned a couple already, but do you have any other books that you would recommend that will broaden our um, members' mythological horizons. Uh, Kate, I'll come to you first. We'll go in reverse order this time. <laughs> Absolutely, I have so many, so I'll try to limit myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, off the bat, um, two Canadian writers that come to mind since I'm the, the Canadian <laughs> on the panel. Um, one of them is uh, Eden Robinson, whose book, A Son of a Trickster and the sequels are about, they're, they're modern stories, but they're uh, informed by um, the stories of indigenous people of the west coast uh, of north america um and they're just wonderful um nalo hopkinson is another canadian writer uh, who retells uh, a lot of caribbean 
folklore uh, in her stories. Um, some other favorites, uh, the, uh, I'll mention one more, Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan, which uh, retells a story of Chang'e, um, a Chinese myth. Uh, and it's just a beautifully written book and the sequel just came out as well. So I highly recommend that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Shauna, what about you? Um, okay, so as, as Ashley said, Daughter of the Moon Goddess is literally the next book I'm about to read. Um, I'm very excited to read that. Um, I read a novella last year called Fire Heart Tiger, um, which is uh, uses Vietnamese mythology, which I really loved. Um, I'm really enjoying reading about mythologies that I've never heard much of before. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's really, really good. That was a top read of, of last year for me. Um, and oh, what was the other one I was going to say? Um, oh, it's, it's left my mind. Um, but in terms of other books about Irish mythology, um, if anyone is interested in that, um, about 100 years ago, a woman called Lady Gregory wrote them all down. Mm -hmm. um, it's called, uh, like, I've sort of paraphrased her title. Her title was Of Gods and Fighting Men. Mm -hmm. So if you ever want to read uh, the Irish mythology that's a bit more from the sources of the time, then that's a really good one to read. And that's sort of the more like the original texts. Awesome, thank you. I have to say that reading your book last year was like, uh, introduction to me for me to Irish mythology so you're now doing that for for readers out there like bringing Irish mythology to people so you know you're, you're all doing that with what you're doing so you should be very proud and and excited about that I think um Rosie I know you're our resident Greek expert but can I challenge you for non-Greek recommendations please um, I'm actually really bad with this. <laughs> I think I, I actually it's my newest resolution to read more from other mythologies because there is I was actually writing down everything you guys were saying because they sound amazing. Um, I think because I'm such like a Greek geek and I love Greek mythology, I, I'm very much like stay in that area. But I I really want to branch out because I mean these sound amazing. Also both you, all your books sound amazing. I really want to read more about Norse and Irish mythology. So. I'm um, I'm going to be on Amazon adding all these to my wish list. But if I also the book actually that's on my shelf to read next is The Witch's Heart, which is the, the Loki's wife retelling, which I've heard really wonderful things about. So um, I'm excited to read that one. No, that's on my reading list for this month, actually, as well. So we can we can buddy read. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Well, I think that we'll close our discussion there with some wonderful book recommendations. All of our TB Red lists are exponentially expanding and we've now got some fantastic mythological recommendations to add to that. Um, on behalf of the Fantasy Fellowship, I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to Shauna, Rosie and Kate for joining us and taking part in this panel. It's been a really wonderful discussion. Um, time has absolutely flown by and I've personally learned a lot and yeah, I really enjoyed it. So thank you all so much. Thanks for um, having us. Yes, thank You're you. Sorry, thank thank you. you for, for having Such us on. Such a pleasure. <laughs> um, we are actually hosting a mythology themed mini prompt challenge over March in Fantasy Fellowship. So if this discussion has whetted your appetite to read more mythology, be sure to check that out. And um, all of our authors on the panel today, their books will fit some of the prompts. So it's an excuse to pick up some of their, their titles too. Um, let us know in the comments what you are currently reading and if you're taking part. You can find the Fantasy Fellowship on Discord. Um, we're on Instagram at fantasy underscore fellowship on twitter we are at fan fellowship and we also have a website fantasy hyphen fellowship.co.uk if you enjoyed this video please be sure to hit the like button and to keep up to date with more fantasy fellowship videos hit subscribe once again, I'd like to thank our fabulous panellists. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege hosting this panel. Um, and now it's time to bid you all farewell. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>